Hello and welcome to Fantasy TV. Today I'm featuring the new book by Jacques Undercroft called Islands on the Fringe, A Year of Micronesian Waves and Wanderers. We're going to ask the author a few questions regarding his new title, which is already on the market. Jacques, what made you decide to move to Micronesia? Um, I knew there was great surf out there. Um, How did you know that? Because you went out there at a time before it was really in the spotlight. Well, I didn't know how good it was. Um, but there had been a kind of underground uh, word of mouth sort of knowledge of, of Western Micronesia as a surf destination. Um, I knew that, that Koh Rai had waves. Um, I don't think anybody really knew the quality of the surf. It's because it's very temperamental and very fluky. In fact, there had been a surf report published by Surf Magazine about waves out there. And actually, they were 100% wrong about the season and what makes it surf. Um, I hired a driver to take me where I knew there was going to be surf, which was not at that time. Um, there was a, the winds were blowing from the southwest. So the only uh, good um, location was the southeast uh, corner of the island. Which, ironically enough, is really the only accessible place if you don't have a boat. And um, I hired a guy to take me down there. And I remember we pulled over at a... Just like witch woman with hair just coming out every direction. And these bloodshot eyes. And um, she said something which I don't understand. And she starts cackling and he's kind of... Um, laughing nervously, and I asked, well, what did she say? And he said, she's going to make it rain so hard that we have to come back and spend the day with her. And um, sure enough, it started raining really hard, but it's always raining that hard, you know, off and on, every couple days there's a major rainstorm. And um, the weird thing was, this pig crossed the road um, at, during our drive, and a lightning flash happened right as the pig was crossing the road. And, Sammy slams on the brakes, and in the flash of lightning, it looks like the pig had the thing. But he freaked out. He's like, oh my god, she's after us. She, you know, the witchcraft is happening. So finally we get there. We, um, we uh, track through the, this mangrove swamp, and, and then suddenly confront this incredible ruin, non Madal, just this most mysterious ruin you can imagine. Um, basalt pillars, just like giant logs, and just total silence around. And we traverse the ruins, and I look out, and there's just these A-frame peaks coming in, probably about head high. Um, and I was like, I'm on. I was the only guy there surfing these, what would be in California, crowded waves, undoubtedly. Well, it turns out I got really lucky to get there at high tide because it's a really fluky wave and only breaks at high tide, and it's not at all what you'd go to Micronesia for. But that part of the island was, you know, just that experience of the whole invitation to my life there. So tell us about your experiences surfing Palakur Pass back in the early days. How many people would show up to surf it when it was good? Um, where were the people from? Uh, was it usually crowded, et cetera? A crowd would have been five guys. Five guys yeah. on a good day at peak pass. A typical crowd was just my buddy, um, Randy, and myself, hmm. Randy Moulet. Actually, um, for a long time, I thought I was the only surfer on the island. <laughs> and um, So no surf camps at that point. <laughs> the concept would have, wouldn't even enter anybody's mind. Why not? Why is it that you didn't exploit the region like others did that came after you? Well, there are a couple reasons why we never wanted to turn it into a surf camp, even though all of us could have done it. Randy certainly could have done it. I could have done it. Other people who knew about the wave could have come back with resources and started a camp. I think we wanted to keep it low-key so that, first of all, we could enjoy it the way it was, but also that others traveling out there would have that kind of soul surfer experience. And when you turn something into a packaged experience, you basically turn it into, into a, something that you buy at a store. You 
you bring money into the equation, at that point you get development. And the, the bad thing about it is the local people come to treat it as like a um, something they depend on, which they were happy beforehand. You know, they didn't, they never needed to have that happen. What people don't realize is that you know they see the pictures in the magazines, they see the the internet ads, and they think it's blue skies and barrels all the time, and nothing could be further than from the truth. To really score it, you've got to live there. And, um, you know, it can rain for three days straight. Um, it can be brutal, um, crazy weather, and it can be flat for months. And people think, okay, I'm going to go to this camp and score. You know, I, I, I hope they do, because they're paying a lot of money to probably not score if they're there in the wrong time. I knew that it was going to start getting hyped up. There was a part of me that, that realized, how many more years does this ha place have left where it's just Randy Moulet and myself? How many more years does it have where... this low key. How did it manage to remain quiet for so long, a place like Palakar Path? I think, you know, I was not the first person to surf there. Randy had it a year before me, and then before him there were other travelers. In fact, Henrik, who came out on the sailboat, um, he knew a guy who surfed there back in the, back in the late 80s, uh, who had actually been attacked by a shark while surfing Pea Pass. And, barely made it back to shore, bleeding from his arm, you know, basically passing out in his boat as he, as he collided with the, with the bar, and that's how they found him. By the way, I mean, I should point out that when it's, when it's seriously happening, like big swell, the waves take care of themselves. I mean, most people are not going to want to paddle out in a triple overhead, top to bottom barrels that are just basically, um, you don't just get off a plane from California and think you're going to ride these waves and get barreled. I mean, you're, you have to acclimatize. I'm sure North Shore regulars can handle it, but it's not the kind of wave that you just waltz into, even as perfect as it is. And if you want heavy, there's the main pass, which I saw in March of 2000 peeling off at six times overhead, um, as coming up halfway up the side of a freighter that was going out through the channel. And... Um, rideable? Rideable. Good. Probably tow-in, perfect, but so big that, I mean, you know, it would take... <laughs> you know, it was definitely beyond, outside my league. And a lot of days were out of my league. So, you know, when I hear about the pros going there, I think, more power to them because 
there's days that were so beyond my ability to surf it well. Would you say it gets that big at least once a winter, or was that? Oh, easily, yeah. Probably twice or three times a winter. And and if P Pass, like I said, isn't isn't that big, the Main Pass can be. Main Pass is that being surfed now? Probably, but it's a much more. It's a much heavier deep water wave with a lot more water moving around. Big lumpy um, uh, ripples that come out of the channel, and um, it's a. Um, it's a heavy wave. Um, P Pass is by far the, the perfect, um, the perfect surf uh, of that we draw on our school books. Tapering, thin lips, but it's still a heavy wave when it gets big. The heavy thing about it is that when you take off, it's like the whole bottom just drops out from under the wave. Uh, the wave might have a four foot back and a ten foot face, you know. And it's, it's coming out of deep water with all the velocity of the open ocean, and it hits that reef and just pitches, and you're going so fast. And, um, yeah, it's, it's like nothing just so. Uh, and then it's, the tough thing about it, when I picture crowded conditions, that there's really one main takeoff spot. I mean, you can sit outside of that, and you can sit inside, but the main takeoff spot is pretty condensed. And, you know, there's five ways to ascend. And, Five surfers are getting rides, and that's it. You know, and you can't. You don't want to sit inside. You don't want to get caught. What type of audience are you trying to reach with your new book, uh, Islands on the Fringe? A year of Micronesian waves and wanderers. It might be someone who's just interested in, in travel on a long-term basis, who is more interested in the. Um, the characters they meet and the lifestyle that they can adapt to rather than a quick packaged surf trip, you know? And um, that's kind of what I focus on in the book, is the type of characters and the, and the experience that one encounters, really what I consider to be on the fringe. So that's kind of the basis of my title, and I'm, I'm trying to reach an audience who's interested in a place like that and maybe um, settling in for the long term. If not, if not several years and maybe a year. But I'd always wanted to do it and when the opportunity presented itself, it's kinda like you have to go, you know. Damn the torpedoes. Forget what the consequences are, you have to go. I'm so glad I did. Because if I hadn't, I might not have ever experienced those waves or the experience of teaching out in an island like this. I have no regrets at all. And I think that's also something that comes through that, that will come through in my book. Um, it was a sacrifice to come back. Um, because I knew that I would, you know, it's giving up really a perfect wave, a perfect uncrowded wave that is now regarded as one of the best rights in the world. But had you stayed, it would have been heartbreaking probably being there during the transition from the most uncrowded best wave in the world to probably the most famous wave. One of the most famous waves in the world as far as being so good and people are so on it now. You mentioned it's not always crowded, but um, I imagine it's quite different now than it was. I, I definitely have a sense of humor in the book that I try to convey. Um, I, I'm trying to convey the sense that I have now of not taking myself too seriously. And um, I see the island itself as a major character in the book. And I'd like to say, you know, to people considering this book, this is not at all a um, a money-making scheme on this part. I'm not seeking a, a wide audience, but I did want to tell the story. And um, I think if people if people read it and enjoy the book, then I'm happy. You know, that, that's really my goal here. The most uncrowded best wave in the world to probably the most famous wave. One of the most famous waves in the world as far as being so good yeah, people are so on it now. Fully illustrated book, uh, not quite a travelogue, more a book of adventure and Micronesia.
back in the day when the lineup was virtually empty, uh, first-hand experiences with diverse characters, uh, cultural uh, insights, as well as probably perfect serve. So check it out. You can order it on Amazon.com and you can special order it at your local bookstore. here and make you aware of a book I wrote that's coming out um, in May of 2013. Um, I actually edited it. It's based on a journal that was found in Lanai, which is one of the Hawaiian Islands. This journal belonged to a professor from Oxford Institution who went to Lanai, Hawaii in 1940 to investigate the disappearance of some villagers at the hands of what were believed to be evil spirits. You know, here in Hawaii there's a lot of something called mana in the culture and history here, which is a sort of natural power that can manifest itself for good or bad, sometimes in the form of evil spirits. But anyway, this book that I have edited and am going to release is this professor's journal entries from his visit to this ghost town in Hawaii that was said to be basically attacked by evil spirits. This professor did not return from his trip. Some speculate he was killed by these evil spirits, but I got a hold of the journal and I got a hold of his photographs and I'm releasing a book about his experience it's actually really chilling, disturbing. It's a great, real Hawaii ghost story, and it's called Old Lanai. I'm showing you the cover here, and check it out. It's going to be uh, a wide format paperback and uh, a much more uh, affordable version ebook with pictures. Once again, out in May 2013. Check it out. It's called Old Lanai Illustrated. There's currently Old Lanai, the abridged version is available on Amazon.com and you'll know this revamped version with the pictures because it's entitled Old Lanai Illustrated. Okay, well uh, check it out. I think that you're going to get quite a fright from it. <laughs>